you're about to join me in something that's pretty special in the life of a filmmaker. I have gone back into my archive and found lost footage. Years ago, when I was first producing Survivor Man, the way I originally wanted to, to show it, to teach all the survival skills, was to actually film and show and include in the cut that would make it to television all of my training on location all around the world. A little bit in the beginning, I was probably nervous, like, will I have enough content to fill out you know, a 45-minute episode uh, with just what happens in the bush? Uh, turns out I didn't have anything to worry about, and I'll get to that in a second, but my initial idea was to film all of my Survivor Man training before I went in to be Survivor Man for a week alone in the woods. So this is a pretty special situation. And uh, to take you back, to, to place us where I was back in, oh gosh, uh, I guess first it was 2001 for the first pilot, 2002 for the second pilot, 2003 is when I was filming season one of Survivor Man. Now at that time, there was nothing like it on television. I know you've heard me say that before, but it's true. I had been watching Bush Tucker Man. I just loved that show. I was not aware of Ray Mears, who was doing some work in the UK. Uh, but in both those cases, those gentlemen were wonderful teachers, and they were showing different bushcraft and survival skills uh, that existed within the wilderness that they were familiar with. In the case of Bush Tucker Man, it was Australia, and of course with Ray Mears at the time it was the UK, although he had a great fascination and I'm sure still does for Canada. Both wonderful men, and as I said, with Bush Tucker Man, I just loved watching that series, and that was before I started Survivor Man. The only other thing that was going on was Mark Burnett's Survivor series, which I always say is, was basically just outward bound with a bunch of hard bodies put on television and you know Burnett scripted a lot of those things to turn out the way he wanted them to. But I give great credit to Burnett for I think being the original and main pioneer of reality television. That's not what I wanted to do. I considered myself a documentary filmmaker. So to me Survivor Man was a chance to document what it took to actually survive in different wilderness environs. But here's what happened. Once I delivered the series to the network, they became so enamored with me actually surviving in the jungle and in the desert and out in the wilderness that all of that training footage that I'd shot, it just never made it to the cut. It was just too long to get to the story. And I, I have to admit, in a way, creatively speaking, I, I did agree with that. It was a long time coming before you ended up in the middle of the jungle with Survivor Man Les Stroud actually surviving. So then I was left with all of this wonderful footage. Well recently I checked in with uh, my editor Luke and Chris and I asked my old partner Barry Farrell, like, Do we, where is that footage? And we are now going through old tapes. I'm talking about standard definition tapes from the year 2003, 4, 5, maybe even 6, uh, where all this footage exists. So we're looking for that stuff and we're finding it and it's kind of pretty cool to be me and to go back and say wow I haven't seen this stuff in well I guess 20 years in some cases okay so let's picture the scene I'm a budding filmmaker I've got a couple of pilots under my belt with uh, Survivor Man what we actually originally called One Week in the Wilderness with Les Stroud then I chopped it together and called it Stranded and then eventually we called them the Lost Pilots and we included them in a Survivor Man season. So they have gone to air and you can see them right here on my YouTube channel, of course, as you can with all of the Survivor Man episodes. I'm just a young budding filmmaker and I'm into the filming of season one. Now this was insanely exciting for me. I mean, I'm a filmmaker heading off to the United States of America to film. But let me step back a second. Before I was to go there, I would ask a lot of my survival cronies, such as Doug Getgood or Fred Rowe or David Arama, you know, who do we know that can show me survival in the desert, survival in the jungle, survival in the ocean, survival in the mountains, because I could do anything when it comes to surviving here in Ontario, but what do I know about surviving in the middle of the desert? Doug Getgood, a brilliant survival instructor here in Ontario, suggested to me a gentleman by the name of David Halliday. Now David was, in the survival world, was famous. He was legendary. He was known as the guy that could teach you desert survival like no one else. He was the hand drill pro when it comes to getting a fire going. In fact, he was one of the first instructors who was learning and then teaching lost skills from, I think in his case, probably the Paiute tribe, but of course he studied under Larry Dane Olson. 
And also there was David Westcott, another legend. These names I'm mentioning, Larry Dean Olson, David Westcott, David Halliday, Mountain Man, Mel DeWeese, these guys were legends when it came to survival, bushcraft, and primitive earth skills. And so we would meet these different people when we would go to places like the Rabbit Stick Rendezvous, uh, which is just a gathering. Uh, think of LARPers, but for primitive earth skills. It still is to this day, I think. So Doug Getgood got me in touch with David Halliday, and I was on my way to Arizona to meet up with this guy I'd never met before, never seen him. He was, to me, only a legend. He had just come off of being a consultant for the movie Castaway. It was him that taught Tom Hanks how to get that plow fire going. So, you know, David's a bit of a legend, and I was going to go learn from the guy. And I called him up, and I said, hey, you know, here's the deal. And I had a little bit of a budget, so I offered him some money to just spend five days with me. And I headed down to Arizona to learn from the man. And this was going to be a great experience. This was going to be five days, just me and David Halliday, alone in the desert, training in survival skills. And I will not disappoint you. That is exactly what happened. I had five straight days of training with David Halliday, and it was amazing. So here is some lost archival footage, stuff that I shot myself, just putting a camera there just like I am right now. I've got a camera there, got a camera there, got a camera here. I'll plop those cameras down and film David Halliday teaching me various skills in the deserts of Arizona. Take a look. This is the first skill. This was me learning for the very first time how to get my hand drill going. But if I'm by myself and I'm worried about energy, you know, I'll let something else hold the board. That way you can squat and get, get some energy rather than having to hold something still in one foot. I taper mine at the top. So I can float for a while before I get started. Get some gear action. Try to get your use your whole the idea is you know, to get, I try to make my hands go up at the last there so you can and maybe get them wet. So go for it. Go. If you find yourself slipping, lick your palm once in a while. More in me, one more in me. Okay, I think you're close, but I'm gonna go ahead. You ready? Yeah. Okay. You got a spark already, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you have spark. Okay. Now, rocks off or? Um... Yeah. Yeah. And then sometimes it's nice to just take a little twig and release it so it doesn't have to fight its way out. Got that floor firm. And then I'll show you an Apache match here next. Squeeze it and you're good. Squeeze it more. There you go. Make a taco. We got it's not the one more now. I'm gonna do a fire. <laughs> ah, nice. My predictions were way off. I figured it'd take a while. First I'm gonna give a good effort to get fire going by using traditional method of this area, the hand drill. Very primitive method. What I've done is first of all I, I got all my tinder bundle, my grass together by hammering it with a rock and making some powder and putting a powder in the middle. 
and you kind of wrap it with some other grass and I actually used one of my wires from the motorbike to tie it off and make myself a fire bundle here. I found this spindle just uh, while I was down getting the creaso cane. It's a piece of seep willow and the baseboard that I'm using is uh, one of the ribs of the Sororo cactus. Uh, all dead and dried out and I've just sort of whittled it down to, to be the right shape for me to work with here. The other thing I did was make this fire lay over here ready to go, just a stick stuck in the ground and then all the other, the heavier wood put on top and that way when your grass goes underneath to, to light up, the heavy wood doesn't crush it and you, you can get a nice good aerated fire to get it going. Now to get to do this right, first I had to just find the right place and then uh, once I've got the, the spindle settling on the baseboard, I cut out a little notch and that'll give a place for all the hot dust to fall down into. Now what I was showing was to try and keep this motion going, if you do the kind of the, the itsy bitsy spider move, you practice that for a while to get the motion right of what it is you want to do while you make this thing spin. when you're spinning really hard, if you're just spinning in one spot like this and you're just doing little short ones, it's a lot tougher to get it going. So that's the motion I want to try and keep happening. And the last thing is, uh, as you can see, I've been practicing It's uh, from these blister marks. It's really easy to get blisters doing this. And so when you've, as soon as you're sort of stopped, you smack your hands together really hard, so hard that it hurts, but that rushes the blood back into the skin and helps anyway to, to prevent the blisters from coming on. Let's give this a try. You really have to suck up the pain as your hands get hotter and hotter. There we go. Ah, uh, carefully. <sighs> yeah, baby. <laughs> Ooh, doesn't that look good? Woo! No cold, no more cold nights for me. It's going to be a warm night, and it's going to keep the peccaries and the mountain lions away from me. This brings in a whole new element of psychological comfort. Yeah. And you know, the beauty about fire in the desert is that there's just dry firewood everywhere, under the mesquite trees and, and different, all, everything's gnarled and dried up and dead. So uh, I'll be able to keep this fire going for a good long time. This is great. Now this next skill that David wanted to show me, I actually was familiar with, but it is manifested differently depending on where you are, whether it's the jungle or the desert or the Canadian forest. It's basically a way to carry fire, a fire carrier. Whether you're putting it in a container or you're wrapping up a bundle of dried materials, well, when it came to learning how to do it David Halliday style, he liked to call it the Apache match. And really, I had learned how to do different fire carriers, well, at least in Canada, uh, but this was going to be a different grouping of dried organic material, and we talked a lot about how to bind it properly, because the problem with carrying a fire in an Apache match or any kind of bundle like that is it's very precarious. Uh, it's delicate. Uh, if you have the bundle too tight, it snuffs out. If you have it too loose, it pops up into flame. It has to be just right to be able to carry your fire for long distances, open that up a little bit, blow it back into flame, and get a new fire going in your new survival location. So learning how to carry fire was always important to me in every location where I went to do survival. 
And true to form, David Halliday was not going to let me down. He wanted to show me how to do that a la Arizona style. Funnily enough, later on when I was with, coincidentally, David Halliday again shooting the Mexico 10 day episode, there I wanted to do a, a fire carrier as well, but we didn't you know, confer on what to do when I was in Mexico. Instead, the storyline there was that I was kind of in a shipwreck situation, the sailboat was uh, disabled, but as a sailor, I had cigars. And I was able to show that actually a cigar is a fantastic fire carrier. Think about it. Cigarettes as well, but they don't last very long. So a cigar can last quite a long time if you look after it. And uh, so I didn't need him to show me anything in Mexico. But here we go. This is David Halliday and I uh, going over the Apache match in Arizona. Crams it down in there, kind of thing. Yeah, makes it tighter. Packing your cigar. And we'll be sure to switch up for better string the second we find it. Trying to burn off all the excess fuzzies. Yeah. That's what you want right there. Now back here in Canada, when it comes to the things you can catch and eat, and I'm talking about the very small things, or as we would always say, the creepy crawlies. I've shown how to catch and eat leeches and frogs and beetles and things. Well, one thing here in Canada that's not that big of a deal when it comes to survival and catching small critters would be grasshoppers, maybe in the prairies, which I hadn't done a show there yet, maybe down in southern Ontario, southern Alberta, you know, grasslands, places like that, sure. But here in northern Ontario where I am, not so much. So when I went down there with David, Dave's like, well, why don't we do grasshoppers? And I was thinking, oh, come on, what are we going to catch three grasshoppers? And I'm actually thinking like a filmmaker, well, that's not much of a scene to show, you know. But no, no, no. Dave's like, no, I assure you, you can get a lot of grasshoppers and make a full meal. So I said, okay, fine. Now remember that, that around the world, these different skill sets, they transfer in principle, but they don't transfer in specifics. The way you light a fire, the way you make a shelter, and which critters you can catch and eat is going to be different from the jungle to the desert, to the tropics, to the forest, to the mountains, you name it. So it was kind of fun. This was actually the first time within the scope of my survival learning that I was taught how to, because there is a method, eat a grasshopper. And if you don't have a lot of good cooking warm stones, then you just heat up the ground under your fire and then move it over and lay them down in the coal in the ashes like ash cakes. So we'll do it easy quickly right there. You'll notice they're going to start hopping a lot once they get warmed up. Can you catch in that movement there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I know I'm going to be a grasshopper eater for a while, I'll find myself a favorite thin flat stone actually build a tripod so it's up above the fire. You want to pick rocks that don't explode. Yeah. So yeah, volcanic rocks, get them hot enough that you can use them as a toasting tray. Just pop, pull them off, pull them off and eat them. They're, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be a little bit, you know, mushy maybe in spots and they're going to have a little dirt on them, but that's Get, kind of like a shrimp fish combo you know something they might be a little bit smoked but I like them I've always considered them as a first line defense against protein starvation and what's and the environment 
Uh, where is the worry with the tapeworms and all that? How does that come into it? Well, or not this area? If you're in an area that's got lots of big animals like cows or dogs, dogs crap. You know, if you're in town or a lot of people with dogs and they're crapping on the ground, and they, cool. dogs always have a lot of tapeworms or, or can, you know. So you want to get them hot enough that you kill the worm if they've got spores in them because grasshoppers are getting on everything. I've got opinions about how delicious I think they are, but they've, they're, I, they're I think it's a great, I, I think it's great. It's yeah, a it's great snack. It's yeah, it's really good. There we are. Little grasshopper. What you do, get as many of them as you can. You just hold them this way. You pull off the head, which pulls the stomach out with it. And this thing, which actually stays kicking for a while, is part of a meal. Once you get enough of them, you make yourself a little, well, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a fish stringer. Might be a bit big, this one. And you poke it through. There we go. And there's one. Let's see if I can get some more. There we go. It's a nice little feast. Look at this big juicy guy. Look at they see they still keep kicking. Even after their heads are completely gone. So, there you go. There's my grasshopper kebab. Now, I can roast it beside the fire, but this doing it this way on top of a rock, like a frying rock like that, is a, is a real cool and easy way to do it. So I think I'll just put these guys on there. Now, what I want to do is just move that over. I'm going to give these guys just a last roasting just to make sure they're fully cooked because uh, they can carry tapeworms. So give these guys a last little roast here. But I think they're cooked pretty nicely. And... Mmm, 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 mmm. Mmm, wings, legs, and all. Hmm, and there's thousands of those guys all around me. So I think I'll keep eating on them for a while. Bon appetit. Now this next bit of skill learning is actually not something I'm going to be able to show you. I did not film it, but I want to tell the story because it's important, especially to myself and David Halliday. David taught me how to catch and eat a scorpion. And that was obviously something new to me. And yeah, frankly, whenever I get asked that question, well, what's the, what's the, the biggest surprise you've had when it comes to eating something as far as it tasting good? And of course, I always usually allude to the witchetty grub in Australia, but I will often also say that scorpions are quite tasty. So let's look at the scene from the actual episode. There he is. Yeah, it looks like a bark scorpion. An awfully big one. Ooh, and he wants to sting me. Look at that thing. The way to eat these guys, what you want to do is hold them down and just cut off the stinger. Look at him trying to sting that. So once you can get the stinger cut off, There. Okay. Now, he shouldn't be much of a problem. Ow! See him nipping onto my finger there? He's Ow! Uh. Like to pinch onto your tongue. Like I said, they're actually quite tasty. Mmm. <laughs> Not bad at all. <laughs> Can't believe I just did that. <laughs> Not bad at all. Mmm. Definitely a bark scorpion. Nice and tasty. 
Now, one of the things that I always looked for when it came to the survival experts teaching me in the deserts and the jungles and down in Cook Islands and so on was, what is their skill set when it comes to edible wild plants? What can they show me in that world? Because I knew that most survival instructors, the macho ones, they never get to that. They don't care about edible wild plants. They just want to hunt. And so when I found someone who knew their edible wild plants, I knew that would be a survival instructor I'd want to learn from because all the rest they will have already learned. It's the last thing most survival instructors ever learn is edible wild plants. I don't know why. It's still my favorite subject matter. But what would happen when I would be listening to these different survival experts, teaching me all the different skills I needed to live in this remote section of the planet, was I would also be thinking as a filmmaker. And honestly, sometimes they would give me a long, drawn-out lesson on something, and I'd think, okay, that's about 30 seconds of footage. You know, they wouldn't really understand the filmmaking side of it, so I had to, in my head, edit through everything I was learning, which was a lot, and think, okay, this is going to make a great scene. This is going to take me all day and still be really cool. This is going to take me all day and give me 30 seconds of footage. Eh, do I really want to show that? No, I had to also think as a filmmaker. And so every day, I would be making my notes with these different instructors, predominantly in my head. And that's a story that David has to share. You see, when I was out there with David Halliday, I didn't take a single note. For a week, I didn't take a single note. And he tells me this story. Well, you know what? Let me let David tell it. This is David Halliday on why I am his hero. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Did, did you capture that? Uh, yeah, you got it. It's recording. Yeah. It's okay, good, yeah. good. Because it's one true. One second, let me get this. Okay. That mosquito's dead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when I met Les Stroud, I was, uh, I think I was visiting my relatives in uh, uh, Arizona, and he had called and said he wanted to meet me down there. And he drove all the way from wherever he came from in a dinky little van. And he, I didn't know who he was, but I, I liked him already. But when I met him and we went out and started doing things, I realized that he, you know, he was this man that was making, uh, making his way with, with skill instead of with money. And a lot of TV people, they would like try to fix everything with a bunch of bucks. And, and, and Les actually knew how to do a lot of things and had used, he started telling me a story how he got into uh, wanting to film things because he said just most survival videos or any you know outdoor videos are just plain boring they take a great subject and make it no fun to watch and i agreed <laughs> and then he started telling me how he learned how to deal with uh, not having the right gear but uh because he was you know making videos of his band he's a musician and he started figuring out how to take duct tape and lots of other things and what i call uh be creative in the process of, of learning how to film himself. And so one day he gets this bright idea, and he's telling me that I could do a better job at this, at filming people out on the land than anybody else has been doing so far. So he trusted himself and was telling me that he's become like a big hit in Canada. And I hadn't heard of him, but I was like, good for you. And he said he wanted to learn about the Sonoran Desert and he'd heard my name. And we had a lot of friends in common, people I like, Doug Getgood, uh, John McPherson and his wife and people that I'd known for a long time and he just said you know when I said I wanted to go to a different environment and and uh, and see the Sonoran Desert and how it works people came up you know with your name they said you a lot and I said great and so he's he's gonna pay me good money in my world to take go on a hike and see what I love and tell him what I think about you know things and feel about things in the Sonoran Desert. So what I noticed was is that he enjoyed himself wherever we went. He liked and listened to most of what I was saying and he wasn't taking any notes, wasn't using a tape recorder or anything. And fast forward, I get excited. I tell my friends, you know, there's this guy I really like that's doing a, a neat show. His name's Sir, uh, Les Stroud, but it, they call him Survivor Man. And people had heard of him, but not quite yet in the United States. And then the show comes out, and we're all waiting at, at the boss trailer to watch the episode. And uh, 
Breck said right after, my, one of my friends, uh, one of the other instructors at Boss said, that's like watching the David Holliday show with a different face. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, all the things he said and the way he said them are things you say. And I said, that, you know what's amazing, Breck? Is he loves the subject matter so much that he actually is, is excited about everything you tell him. And he got some flack for saying some of the things I said. I believe that I'm still right about being careful with certain animals that look cute and will bleed you out, you know, in seconds when they finally give up feeling safe with you. So, I mean, he, he, people made, uh, I'm sure people made fun of you for talking about how dangerous it could be, but I was telling the stories of all the worst things I knew that had happened in my 40 years of living in the Sonora Desert and the possibilities, because I think that's part of teaching. It's like my dad always said, prepare for the worst and then enjoy the rest. So what I loved about Les is that he really, really uh, loved the earth, loved the subject matter, and was able to retain information because he cared about it. And was, I believe, very accurate to teaching what he had learned from me. Uh, as a consultant... And as his time got on and got, he got richer experiences and became more and more uh, capable of passing on the information well, uh, I think there were times when he got to where he could teach me how to teach him. And eventually I began to see Les as uh, kind of a, a, a shaman on his own terms. He started getting enough experiences that he was out there uh, dipping into the same beautiful world that I'd uh, dipped into, which is the spirit of the matter, and uh, just continue to love and appreciate that his, uh, his reasons for doing what he do, does is the, are the same as mine, same as Westcott's, same as Jose's, same of, of all the people that I trust. They are accurate teachers of things they believe are important. So they're even if we're uh, occasionally misinformed or sharing an idea that's not quite accurate, it's because we're aiming for that and we're going to get there. And so I like Les. How much do I owe you? Uh, David Halliday. Can you give me, can you give me one of those cool, those cool knives? <laughs> uh, they're uh, $69.95. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, David knew. He knew that I honored the skills he was teaching me and that the best thing I could do was verbatim repeat what he had taught me but without writing a single thing down or filming it it was all in my head but why was it in my head because I just loved these skills so much that you just had to teach me once I'm gonna remember that plant I'm gonna remember that skill and uh, and then it manifested itself in great footage and a great story to tell based on surviving in the desert now, I talked about the skills that travel around the world, various ways of making fire carriers, various ways of starting fires, shelter building. And another one that goes around the world that is the same kind of skill but is different everywhere you go is actually rope making. And with David, he was showing me the rope making based on the yucca plant and the cactuses and the different plants that were there. But there was one thing he showed me. Now, this is going to be a scene of us learning some rope making, but there was I did not film one thing that he showed me. And I'm going to show you that clip right after. This is learning rope making in the desert with David Holliday. And it led to a particular scene that becomes, for me, one of my, if you will, iconic Survivor Man moments. This agave is a very useful plant. And if you're careful, it has a neat trick that you can do in case you need a needle and thread. If you're really careful, ow! Really careful. Ah. Uh. Uh. You can actually pull yourself out a needle and thread. That spike 
from the top of the agave plant and I just bit below it to break the fibers and then I got a really strong cord here, super strong. I mean, I can't break that no matter what. And if I, you know, want, I can peel it apart and break apart, just tear apart the fibers and just get it down to one single tiny strong thread. And I mean, that can be used as a suture if you've got a bad gash or certainly for clothing or anything else you need sewn together. And if the edge here is just a little bit too, see that edge there? If that's just a little bit too thick, you can grind it down on a rock. You got yourself one good strong needle and thread. Very useful plant. Now I'll also uh, take uh, the uh, one or a couple of the leaves off because I can pound them and pull fiber, fibers out from the leaves as well that I can use for tying. This just breaks apart the agave leaf. And as you can see, underneath it is all kinds of fibers. They're really strong and can be used for great rope and cordage material. Lots of good fibers there. All I have to do is get rid of the mush out of it. Yeah, the first place is to just go right down the middle and then quarter that. And if you don't have you do it, it with your mouth, if so you can't do it with your fingers, you can just go bite into a little ways. Mm -hmm. So you want to take the, the, the chunky end and tie it to the chunky end in a square knot. And then you just tie the skinny ends to the skinny ends and you can just keep flippy flopping like that and make yourself as much string as you want. And it binds really well and stays bound and doesn't get too brittle. Put your, put your hands together like that. And we'll just tie you up right now. I know you don't want to go to the top of the mountain, kid, but that's where <laughs> we're going. Wow. Too tight, but you're you're bound. If I, even if I don't tie a knot, it's going to take you a little bit of a struggle. But just see if you can. Oh, yeah, that's not going anywhere. Right. So what, what all we want to do is make sure that our you know little match doesn't light up, up too much. So not as much labor to get a string and it's much stronger. Easy to work with stuff. And it's wet too. It's 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 live, which means you know it's not gonna burn easily. So you want something that'll hold up. Like, watch, I can get a lot more air out of my bundle there. And that'll just keep the bundle from burning so fast. Right. It definitely will keep it from being able to, to flame as much. That'll definitely keep it tighter. Tighter. Hey, you can sure feel it now. Yeah. It's much more solid. So there you have it. That is and was the original footage of me learning so many years ago, looking so much younger, with actually some thinning hair on my head, uh, survival skills from the legendary David Halliday. Uh, we're still very close friends to this day. And to this day, I still very much value the learning you can do from an actual instructor, a real expert. Now with my series Wild Harvest, I go out and I train and learn in all of the wild edibles wherever I'm going to be. I can't naturally know all of the plants around the planet. So I go ahead of time to learn them and train in them and understand them, understand their vitamin and mineral components and how to harvest them and when to harvest them. I can only learn that from an actual expert. Now I can learn from the books and I can go online. That's great, I can even talk to a few people, but you wanna be out there. And that's the same thing I think for a lot of survival skills. You wanna be out there with an expert showing you how to start this fire, how to build this shelter properly, which plants you can gather and eat, which ones are toxic and poisonous and that you have to stay away from. And I am hoping, now that we've shown you this Arizona lost footage, that we will find some more archival lost survivor man training footage and bring it to you. I guess then it won't be lost, will it? See you next time. Oh, cold and fresh. You know, 
Utilizing our natural environment to survive in and doing things like eating live scorpions or cutting down live trees are only necessary if you truly have to survive. I've shown some ways of surviving a very harsh climate. While you're out, leave only footprints. Let's set up some good protected areas so that our grandchildren also have this beauty to enjoy.